Well, greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and this is another episode of Flat Earth Can't Science. Today we're going to talk about one of the classic experiments that was one of the earliest determinations of the circumference of the Earth. Indio 007 had done a video a while ago on the experiment of Eratosthenes. His claim was that this experiment was just as valid on a flat Earth as it is on a spherical Earth. We're going to have a look. We're also going to discuss how we determine the distance to the moon and the sun. So let's get started. Eratosthenes was a Greek scientist and mathematician living in Alexandria. In 205 BC, he designed an experiment that was the first accurate measurement of the circumference of the Earth. It was known that on one day a year, the rays of the sun reached the bottom of a well in Sini, Egypt. It was reasoned that by measuring the angle of a shadow in Alexandria some 500 miles distant, an estimate could be made of the circumference of the Earth. Although this experiment was undertaken with the assumption that the Earth was a globe, certain other assumptions were made. First, the sun was very distant, so distant in fact that sunlight arrived in parallel lines. Second, the distance between the cities was done as part of an annual land survey following the floods of the Nile. While professional surveyors of the time did conduct the measurements, the measurements were done by a number of paces along the banks of the river Nile. While this was a rather crude form of measurement, comparing it to Google Earth at this time demonstrates the distance between the two points is indeed approximately 500 miles. So they did a pretty good job. The shadow length was 7 degrees. This was estimated to be approximately 1 50th of the circumference of 360 degrees. And as a result, a final calculation of 25,000 miles. This compares favorably with modern determinations of 24,900 miles which, quite frankly, is a remarkable achievement considering all they had to work with was a measured pace and a stick. Now, returning to Indio 007's video, if there was a small local sun, we could reproduce the 7-degree shadow. However, if the sun was indeed shown to be very distant with parallel rays, the flat Earth would be disproven. So then the question logically becomes, how can we prove the distance to the sun? Although a number of the flat earth proponents on the discussion board did allow that the disproving of a small local sun would in fact invalidate the flat earth concept, several pointed to corpuscular rays as an indication that the sun could indeed be triangulated and was a local event. While the original experiment did assume that the earth was a globe and sunlight was parallel in nature, a small local sun would actually reproduce the findings of the experiment at least at the two points that were measured. The equation itself is rather straightforward. We know the distance between the cities of 500 miles and we know the angle to the sun of 7 degrees. Plugging these numbers into the equation, as you can see, shows that the distance from the Earth to the sun is 4,065 miles and it is approximately 35.5 miles in diameter. Once again, if we can prove that this is the case, that the sun is only 4,065 miles away and 35 and a half miles in diameter, the experiment can be easily reproduced on a flat Earth. However, if the sun is greater than 4,065 miles by a significant margin, the flat Earth is invalidated. So as I was going through a few mental gymnastics to try and figure out how I could calculate the distance from the Earth to the sun from the Earth, I began to think about the phases of the moon. And as it turns out, like with many ideas, somebody else had already thought of it, so credit where credit is due. Let's bring in Aristarchus of Samos. He built upon previous determinations that the moon was in fact in orbit around the Earth. To look at the phases of the moon and note that the first quarter and the last quarter of the moon were at 90 degrees to the Earth in relationship to the Sun. Leading up to this was the first method that I had thought about and that was looking at the difference in the angle between high noon on Earth and sunset. I reasoned that if I could calculate a different angle from 90 degrees at sunset I could use that to triangulate the distance to the Sun using the radius of the Earth as a baseline measure. Unfortunately when I ran the numbers on this I found that the degree of precision 
was simply too great even for modern science. We're talking on the order of six and ten thousandths of a degree. Given our ability to measure angles this small through a atmosphere at sunset, it's just not a viable method to calculate the distance to the sun. Following through on this technique, and given the fact the orbital radius of the moon is greater than the radius of the Earth, this can be done with some precision using the phases of the moon. This was done, and the angle to the moon at the half moon phase was found to be 89 degrees and 51 minutes rather than a precise 90 degrees. This allows us to directly demonstrate that the orbital distance of the moon is approximately one four hundredth of our distance to the sun. This distance to the sun is given the name one astronomical unit. Using the phases of Venus, we can likewise calculate its orbit to be 0 0.72 astronomical units, and in fact Mars is 1.5 two astronomical units. The moon being one four hundredth of the distance from the Earth to the sun is given an astronomical measurement of 0 0.0026 AUs as its distance from Earth. Plugging these numbers into our flat Earth determinations, we find that 1 AU is 4,065 miles. The distance to the moon is 10.45 miles or 55,000 feet. The distance from the Sun to Venus is just shy of 3,000 miles, and just over 6,000 miles is the distance from the Sun to Mars. In order for the flat Earth model to be correct, these numbers by definition must be correct. If they are disproven, the flat Earth is disproven. Now, so far, all of our measurements are relative to one astronomical unit, and one astronomical unit has been determined by triangulation of the Sun. As these are calculated measurements, if we have any direct measurements to any of these bodies, we must throw those calculated measurements out and use the actual directly measured values. Disregarding the fact that we have been to objects like the Moon and know precisely how far away they are, Let's look at some ways of actually physically measuring the distance between interplanetary bodies. The first of these methods is parallax. Parallax involves sighting in on an object at two different times in the Earth's orbit six months apart and seeing how it shifts against the background of very distant stars. During an opposition of Mars, when Mars was closest to the Earth in 1690, Cassini used this method by sending uh, one of his colleagues uh, to a very distant location, they both took measurements between Mars and Earth on the same day and using parallax calculated an astronomical unit. Flamstead used a similar method, taking a measurement just after sunset and another one from the same location just prior to sunrise and calculated the parallax to Mars as well. Although they used slightly different methods to measure parallax both came up with a similar astronomical unit of 87 million miles. Equipped with very precise measuring equipment and timepieces, teams of scientists were dispatched throughout the world 80 years later in 1769 to witness a transit of Venus across the Sun. These teams, which included one in Tahiti under Captain Cook of the British Navy, were able to determine one astronomical unit was 24,000 Earth radii, or 95 million miles. Next came Kepler's laws of planetary motion. These allowed us to determine the duration of a single orbit of a planetary body and from that derive its orbital distance and speed. Finally, we have the direct measurements of the distance from the Earth to the Moon with Project Diana in 1946. This was an early radar experiment, and despite radar being in its infancy, uh, you can see the original radar trace there demonstrating the distance to the Moon is 238,000 miles. This was followed up in 1961 with the first direct radar returns from the planet Venus. And now we bounce lasers off of the moon to directly measure the returns and calculate the distance to the moon within a matter of centimeters. Before I sum this up, I'd like to return to corpuscular rays of the sun. As you recall from earlier in this presentation, these rays from the sun come through gaps in the clouds and give the appearance that we can easily triangulate up to a local sun. 
However, for all corpuscular rays, there are anti-corpuscular rays, as you can see here. These are easily seen by turning your back to the corpuscular rays and looking 180 degrees in the other direction. The fact that they converge again reveals their nature to be parallel rays, and we're seeing a trick of perspective and an optical illusion. So in conclusion, the experiment of Aristosthenes using the shadow length to determine the circumference of the globular Earth is indeed valid. This will work on a flat Earth as well, given very specific conditions, such as a local small sun. However, disproving those conditions, as we have done, disproves the flat Earth. So while the original video by Indio007 did want to bring up the point that the experiment with shadows can be performed on a flat Earth given certain conditions, he failed to follow through and actually calculate what the distance to the sun would have to be and see the evidence as to what the distance to the sun actually is. So now you must actually disprove all of these direct measurements of the Earth to the sun as well as show it is only 4,065 miles away. Good luck to you, fellas. Thank you for watching. This is Bob the Science Guy. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel. This rabbit hole's too deep for me.